The Celtic Exchange, a fresh insight on Celtic Football Club. Celtic entered a challenging run of fixtures this week, which will go a long way to determining where the league title ends up this season. And they'll be doing so without captain Callum McGregor, top scorer Kyogo Furuhashi, as well as the shining lights that are Tom Rogic and Dyson Maeda. This leaves Ange Postacoglu with some big calls to make as he navigates us towards next week's Glasgow Derby. This is episode 54 of the Celtic Exchange Weekly. This is Tino, and this week I'm joined by our very own Paddy, as well as a special guest in the shape of Hamish from 67 Hail Hail. Hamish, I'll come to you first. Welcome to the Celtic Exchange. Good to have you here. How are you feeling about all things Celtic at the moment? I'm good, yeah. Um, I, I was quite pleased on, on Saturday with, with the victory, getting through to the next round of the Cup. Um, a little bit surprised with some of the negativity, just, just to throw a wee spanner in the works right away on, on my debut on the podcast. I was a wee bit surprised with, with how negative people were, um, given that, you know, it was our, our, our first game back, um, you know, in the, the cup of the weekend um, and, and up against, you know, a side who were camped in and, and tried to make it as difficult as possible for us. We got the win, we're through it the next round, so all was good. I like that. Paddy, likewise, welcome back to the hot seat. I've actually had a bit of grief from folk on YouTube recently, giving it, where's Paddy, where is he? He's right here. How are you feeling? I'm uh, um, nice and refreshed, all ready to come back for this uh, this new year. It's good to good to see you all. Uh, great having you back on with us, uh, Hamish, and obviously, yep, here's to many more with yourself as well, mate. Um, I thought Saturday, yeah, I thought it was a, you know, it was a, a bit of a difficult game for us, um, but you kind of look at Celtic on that type of pitch, um, this season especially just the way it's kind of slowed our type of play down we could normally run uh, teams off the park at the moment the way, the way we've, we've been playing and I'm not I, I agree I, I don't see the need for negativity um, you look at games like that in the past they've always been a wee bit stuffy um, so no I'm, I'm not bothered by it I, I, I still think you know we've been given actually a really good home draw against Rafe Rovers I think we should go on and, and, and you know do do the damage against them as well. I'm not worried about that at all on Saturday. Yeah, no doubt. So what we'll do just to um, line up this week's show, we will cover the fallout from Saturday's game against Alloa first of all. We'll then look ahead to those really big fixtures. So Tynecastle on Wednesday against Hearts, Celtic Park on Saturday against Dundee United and, and everything else around that. So, yep, as mentioned, Saturday saw us back in Scottish Cup action for the first time this season. A visit to the Indodrill to play Alloa. Who I should point out, I didn't quite realise, they're actually third bottom of League One in the SPL just now, SPFL. So low ranking, you know, no mm-hmm. doubt. But as you say, Paddy, difficult surface, sticky kind of game. So that said, though, it should have been fairly routine, you know, but in the end it turned out to be far from that. So what was your, your general take on the match? General take on it, there was only one team trying to play football. Um, I understand there's this kind of Scottish football like mantra that, um, you know, the lower leagues, they're going to make it hard for the opposition. It's going to be... Uh, like rough and ready, they're going to get stuck in and, and try and get in, you know, basically the the, the the players' faces. I think that's exactly what Ferguson had set them up to do. Um, so that makes it harder, you know. It, the, the game has moved on from those days of, you know, just everyone running about after the ball and trying to hit each other hard at a fast pace. I think, you know, we're a better technical side than anyone in the, in, in the country, in my opinion. Um and basically, we're just we're just up against Hatchet Men the other day. Um, so I, it slows us down. It stops us for trying to keep the ball on the deck. And like I say, parks like that slow us down too. So no, nah, just one of those games. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt there was some heavy challenges doing the rounds, and you know maybe that's something we we could and should have anticipated. Hamish, there's obviously a, a little bit of flack doing the rounds in terms of Angie's squad management, you know, and and who he picked and who he didn't pick. What do you take on that? What's your opinion of it? I don't have a massive opinion. I think you you, you play, you know, your your best players when it's a, a meaningful game, and mm-hmm. it was a meaningful game. This wasn't a, a dead rubber, as I think some people have suggested. This, you know, I, I got some of the the criticism maybe for the Real Betis game because that was a dead rubber. Should he have brought Keogh go on? I actually felt, you know, going back to that game, that the injury was just bad luck, and I, I wasn't one of the people who were kind of having a go at Ange at that stage. Certainly not on. On Saturday, um, you know, a, a big game back, Scottish Cup, a trophy that we obviously want to win, a trophy, you know, that we'll need to win if we want to win the treble. Away from home, maybe if it was at home, you could maybe rotate it a wee bit more. Mm-hmm. And he did rotate it to an extent, but, you know, if we're, if we're focusing in on, on Callum McGregor, 
you know, when I saw him in the starting lineup, I didn't really have, you know, any thoughts either way. I think he's such an important player for us. He, he links the play from defence to attack like no one else does, you know, in, in the entire squad. So if you don't play Callum McGregor, you, you lose out on that. And I just think the injury is bad luck. It's not a, a muscular injury, you know, down to yeah. playing too much football. It's just a, a really unfortunate, you know, facial knock that, that we've probably seen four or five of them in the 21st century. And you remember them straight away, Larson. Um, Ayer had a bad one Ryan Christie's one at Hamden yeah. Dylan McGeoch against Real Madrid you kind of remember them so easily because they're so rare and I think that yeah. was just what we saw on Saturday Yeah I mean Paddy Hamish has mentioned I thought we had quite a nice blend in the team you know mm-hmm. there's guys that don't usually start so Gucci obviously get his first start for the team Jack Amakis hasn't started a lot of football Skills isn't at the moment certainly the first choice left back Stephen Welsh isn't a regular starter so he has introduced guys that don't usually feature alongside the more experienced the McGregor's now Maeda, guys like Tom Rodic. I think he did try and balance it. I don't think he's gone full, full strength. And as I mentioned to Hamish last night, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, he's going to... Hindsight's a great thing. So now that McGregor picks up that freak injury, and it is a freak injury, you know, and just getting a wee bit of flack. Yeah, absolutely. You, you just nail on the head there, Tino. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. A lot of people will... I think a lot of the reaction from fans at the moment is that we know that we're coming into such a busy run of games and it's it's nerves just now. We've, we've signed these players um, in January and I think we're all just kind of wanting to see how we kick on for the second half of this season and any small slip up, like I think it was only maybe about 10 days ago, um, you know, we're talking about the potential postponement of this game coming up against Rangers and how, you know, we were worried about like losing players now actually well, it then went to well Rangers might lose players that with international games coming up now it's looking like we're the ones that are going to be sitting actually struggling um, the injury list has seemed to have grown again but I agree with, with Hamish we've got to have our best players on the park and I, I thought that the core of the team you've played Hart you've kept um, you've, you've, you've kept obviously McGregor in there as well I think you need that. You need big players for small, like smaller games like that because it is a big game. We do want to go and win the treble this yeah. year. That is on the table for us and we've got to push for it. You've actually said we're going for the quadruple this well. year. I can't have you in Egan. <laughs> you said we're going for all four, so uh, we'll see how that plays out. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, team selection aside, Saturday night, it wasn't a game which will be chalked up as a classic, you know, by any stretch. Um, and though I never felt we were in any real danger of not winning the game, mm. We struggled to t- to find uh, who we thought was your man in the match. Paddy, did anyone stand out for you for Celtic? Um, for for the goal alone, I actually thought um, it would be well for both their finishes. I thought Jackie Marcus and I thought um, the goal from Abada. They were just really, really well taken goals. The movement for Jackie Marcus for the first goals really, really good. Mm. Really good. He, he split the split the defence, and it's a great first time finish. A great ball from Liam Scales. I don't think it was one of those games that we had a standout performer. I would just put it down to the, the you know, the good finishing from both players. Yeah. I mean, both of those players that you've mentioned, Skills and Jack Amakis, they're the kind of guys that will be looking to stake a claim for the second half of the season. Do you think they've done enough to convince Sanji that they can play a part? I, I like Liam Scales. Um, I, I don't think there's a big gulf between him and Greg Taylor to the extent where I think you could kind of, you know, flip a coin for, for who plays there going forward. I think Ange sees Greg Taylor as the number one left back, but I I honestly don't think there's much in it. And every time I see Liam Scales, without him completely blowing me away and, you know, saying, oh, that guy's unbelievable, he puts in steady performances. He's a really steady player. And I mean that in a kind of positive way. He's Mm -hmm. he's reliable. Yakimakis is a really, a really kind of funny one, I think, because we've not actually seen much of him really at all. he's, He's kind of had injuries to contend with. He's been playing second, third fiddle to, to other strikers. He's been coming on for 10, 15 minutes in games. And he's actually looked at his best when he's come on as a sub in games when we've been closing them out. I mm. think uh, I think both games against uh, Ferenc Faros, he came on, took some knocks, really played well. And, and you're kind of thinking there's something there, there's a player there. But then when you actually see him sometimes, you know, can you go and get that big goal? And I realise he scores the first goal on Saturday. But in general, I, I just wonder if he's, you know, well-rounded enough and, and you know, is an Ange, enough of an Ange player to be a success at Celtic. So I've got some doubts over him, but there's definitely, you know, attributes there that you can work with. I think for me on um, on the big man, I, I, I've kind of got to give him the benefit of the doubt. Like like you say, it has been sporadic um, appearances as fr- from the bench. He started the other night. 
And, you know, he's still getting up to speed. You've got to remember, like, a lot of players are getting maybe three, four, five games at a run at starting. And I just think, you know, getting that goal is only going to do his confidence, the world of good. And it potentially from there he kicks on. He said it himself, he feels that this could be the beginning of his season. And, you know, that, that's only a good thing. Um, I think he offers us something different. And like you say, the games against Ferenc Varos, the way he did hold it up, the way he kind of let our midfield come out in those games at some points. Not that we, we, were, we were struggling too much against him, um, but I think he offers that dimension that we can hold up and let our two wingers kind of come up next to him and then w- the, the counter-attack continues through him, um, which is a bit different from someone like Furuhashi who's playing through the lines and wanting the ball in, in behind or over the top, you know? So yeah. I, I'm... I'm quite positive about him. I think he'll come good. He'll, he'll be judged in goals, won't oh, he? And, and his goal scoring record so far isn't actually that bad. I yeah. think if you looked at the amount of minutes he's played, he's maybe played 200 minutes or something like that all in and he scored a couple of goals. So he's got off to an all right start and maybe he's, he's not going to be a player that we look at and go, he's brilliant, all, mm-hmm. all round player. But if he's putting the ball in the back of the net, like he did on Saturday, and if he's more clinical, even than he was on Saturday, because he had that chance right after the goal, you know, if he walks away with a couple of goals on Saturday, I think it's a very different conversation we're having. Yeah, I think he's really looking to, to kick, on, kick on. It's a very important time for him, you know, and this is where he really should be looking to make his mark. You're right, Paddy's post-match comments. I think paraphrasing, but he said something along the lines of, this isn't the end, this is just the beginning and I'm looking to bring the thunder back to the Ender Drill Stadium. <laughs> uh, what told do you make of that? Told you not to bring that up again. <laughs> um, but he, had, he has mentioned that he had some... Injury was, I think he had surgery, he's mm-hmm. revealed, and he's only now starting to feel fit and healthy and ready to, to stake a claim. I think he's very much an old-fashioned type of centre-forward, and to your point, Hamish, he's not quite an Ange player. Doesn't mean he can't do a job for us, and he won't get a better chance than these next few games. But what is his job, though? When you when you look at the kind of ideal scenario for, for what Gigi can, can bring us, where do, where do you see him fitting in? Is he a player who, you know, everyone kind of seems to think he's a player who'll come in and can maybe play when defences are a bit more you know, packed in and Kyogo doesn't have the space to run in behind. Is is that where you see him fitting in? Yeah, for me, definitely. Um, I go back to the games against Livingston um, away and St Mirren just before Christmas there. And it got to a point where every ball that was getting put into the box was getting hit, hit, nodded away. Uh, and we were up against 10 men defending in their box. And you need someone that's going to just kind of like win the ball in there for a start, but also hold the ball up for players that run off a bit stronger than what other other forwards can do. Um those games are few and far between. There are some some of the like the the top half of the, the, the table that do come and try and play against us and that's when we're at our best in my opinion. The likes of Hibs, Hibs have done it. Um we're kind of hoping we'll, we'll, we'll see maybe something similar from Hearts and Wednesday. But when you're playing the bottom and they're hoping for a point at most against us he could come in handy in those games in my opinion yeah. I mean we've wet, yet to see you know full strength Kyogo fit GG fit mm. anyone else chapping are you calling him GG already have I uh, already you've, 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 you've coined the phrase it's in my notes um, trademarked by 67 <laughs> yeah, GG and JJ that's it Maeda's also you know now got the feature so Ange has never been able to to call on these guys all at the one time so it will be interesting you know touch with Kyogo's not too far away and there are concerns over that but hopefully all these guys are fit and available some point very soon and we can see exactly how Ange intends to use them. Will he change it after an hour with Jack Amakis coming off the bench? Will he at some point look to, you know, rotate between him and Kyogo and Maida? Who knows? But I don't think he's a first choice by any stretch. And there's a real challenge for him there to go and use these next three, four games and become that. But I don't think that's quite how Ange sees him. No, I, I can agree. I, I agree with you there. Um, I just think that we've kind of got to give him this fresh start and give him a chance. Um, I still think the penalty sticks in people's minds. It's in my mind. Um, well, you know, he's a striker. You should be able to take the ball and put it in the spot and put it in the net. He done it a lot for Venlo last season. Nine um, out of ten, I yeah. think, last season. So, I mean, you've you've got to kind of look at that. The centre forward wants to take the penalty. The centre forward takes the penalty, in my opinion. Yeah. Now that we've seen several penalties from Juranovic, mm-hmm. it, it makes it all the more puzzling why he never took that. He is ice cold with the PKs. He just does not miss. So it's a puzzler as to why Jack Amakis stepped up that day. I agree with you there, but I think because it is not so early in the season, but it was that earlier part and people are stating their claim. There's not so many people settled and there's not so many leaders at the, in that squad yet. I can understand why that possibly would have happened. What happens on Wednesday if they're both in the team? 
Ah, it's, it's Jaranovic all day. A hundred. Yeah, but yeah. did Ange not come 50%. out after that missed penalty and, and say he's my penalty taker? I think Ange has been a bit cute. I think he was protecting him that day yeah. and trying to take the flak for him. I think that was a spur of the moment. Jack and Marcus, 90th minute. His career hadn't really got going at Celtic and I think yeah. he took the opportunity there. I think there's no doubt about it. JJ rather than DG <laughs> takes the penalties. Listen, what we'll do, we'll move on from the Arlo game, but just one final point on it. Do you lads have any issues with the perceived heavy challenges that Arlo have put in or have they got every right to do so? And it's up to Don Robertson to take care of that and to, to protect the ball players. No, nah, just like I say, football's moved on. Teams like Aloha haven't. Oh, harsh. Hope there's no Aloha fans listening. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have a lot of Aloha fans, I no. don't think, but you never know. What do you think, Kimish? Was it heavy-handed or was it par for the course? I've been kind of thinking about this a lot since, since our conversation last night, you know, and I think... I, I just kind of think it's it's just what we have to deal with. It doesn't make it right, but I remember Brendan Rodgers' first season, there was a period we went through where this was a talking point. I think Motherwell had had a couple of really bad, there was a really bad one in Tierney, and that was kind of the, the latest in a long line of, of you know, teams getting really physical and, and you know, taking it too far to, to try and stop Celtic, who were playing so well. And I think that's just what we're going to see. You would hope maybe that, you know, we'll, we'll we'll see some more red cards dished out because there, there's certainly been three or four already this season that, that you know, haven't been punished. Mm. Halliday, you know, funnily enough, at, at Tynecastle and McGregor. Yeah. Um, the, the one the other day, the, the other one that springs to mind that was called out was the Alan Power one on, on Turnbull at, yeah. at Celtic Park. That there, There's been a few. Callum Butcher on David Turnbull. which Yeah, sorry, that's nice. an obvious one as well. Yeah. And that, that wasn't punished, you know, until after the game. So... Yeah. I, I just think it's something we're going to have to deal with, sadly. Yeah, it's tricky because retrospective red cards are fine, but it doesn't really help Celtic. The irony of Callum Butcher's yeah. one was he continued that game. He only got a yellow. He played out the game. Turnbull was a very lucky lad that day that he never picked up a serious injury at the time. Mm-hmm. And then Butcher ironically ends up suspended for a Rangers game a few games further forward. So it actually benefits Rangers, doesn't help Celtic, but... What can you do? Listen, we will move on. So you've mentioned there, uh, Hamish, that we do face Hearts at Tynecastle on Wednesday. It's the first of two really, really big games and, and really big challenges for us. We've got Dundee United at Celtic Park on Saturday. The immediate concern over these games are the players who will be missing. So we know for sure we're going to be without Callum McGregor. We'll get into a wee bit more detail on that. Kyogo, Maeda, Tom Rogic for sure. There's also some doubts over Gucci and Abada, although I think Angie's a bit more optimistic about them. So, Paddy, let's start with the skipper. It looks likely he'll miss something along the lines of 46 weeks. Suggestion is it's a fractured cheekbone. He may have surgery this week on it. How big a loss is he going to be to the team in the coming weeks, in addition to the the, the guys we already know will be missing? It's huge. Um, we found a bit of momentum at the beginning of the season and uh, McGregor picked up an injury and missed a few games and we noticed such a huge change in uh, how how we operate as a team um, he is our, our main player without a shadow of a doubt he's for me still to this point the best player in, in this country Do you see him as more important than Kyogo to us? Uh, entirely yeah. entirely he, he makes us tick um, and I think he'll be a, a huge miss but it gives someone like Atati the opportunity to come in and, and you know, show that he, he can fill that void. Um, he's, he's signed his incredible first impression against Hibs. Um, and let's see if he's possibly put into that role or he's kept where he was and we maybe see the likes of Beaton coming in because this is where our squad, thankfully, has been bolstered that we're able to kind of call on other players. But... Um, there's no doubt that we're, we're going to lack that quality. Yeah, no doubt. Hamish, do you think we've got enough to cope? In his absence, Paddy's mentioned the likes of Beaton and Hatati. Who do you think will step into the number six for Wednesday and the next few fixtures? I think it'll probably be Beaton. Um, I'd be a little bit worried about Eddie Gucci, you know, starting that game because, you know, the severity of, the, of that challenge. It was a really, really bad challenge. And it's the kind of, you know, injury that you would you would think if it's not going to keep him out, Long term, he would certainly, you know, not be fully fit for for Wednesday. I'd be yeah. surprised. Um, and even if he was fully fit, you know, if you're talking about Hatati and and probably O'Reilly playing in front of him, do you, do you really want three, you know, new signings playing in the same midfield at Tynecastle? So, so I think it will be near beat on. And, and as I've just alluded to, I think it'll be Hatati, and I think we'll see O'Reilly uh, on on Wednesday night. I really do. Yeah. What do you think, Paddy? In agreement yeah, with that? I'd agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It is interesting. I've never quite thought of the fact that it could be three new guys. So whether it's, you know, Gucci, Hatati, O'Reilly, three guys who are talented footballers, they know how to play ball, but they've not been to Tynecastle. And, you know, 
it's not Galatasaray away or whatever, but, but it could, it's, it's it intimidating could, and it couldn't, you know, impact their performance. Could also be a good thing. They might not be phased by it at all. Yeah, true. Yeah, they, they just went, clear still. Yes. Just turn up, do the business and head up the road. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, with the guys that are missing, Angie's got some serious big calls to make and out with that midfield three, you know, he's got a question mark over the front three. So I think we're going to see Jota make his first start in a number of weeks. So he'll come in on the left, in my opinion. I think James Forrest will come in on the right who does know all about Tyne Castle and what's required there, I think he might come in ahead of a badder. And I think it's quite likely and quite obvious that it'll be Jack Amakis. Is that what you think, Andrew, go with? I'd be, I'm not I'm not entirely sure yet, um, I, but I would be comfortable with that. I really would. I, I agree with you. Someone like Forrest, who, again, is someone for me that just needs that to kickstart the season um, and, you know, get up to speed with things. And I think it will happen for him, but this could be the game and he knows that, that place inside out, he's comfortable there. It doesn't phase him. Um, yeah, I would be quite happy if he did start against them, definitely. Yeah. I think, Hamish, the options at centre forward are, are seriously limited. You know, there is a suggestion that a bad I can maybe do it. I, I thought he'd done I thought he done fairly well against St. Johnson, but I, I'm not as excited as some other people were. I think some people were giving him rave reviews. I thought he was fine. He took his two goals very well, but I think it was very much a stopgap. Other options might be somebody like Joey Dawson, who's, you know, come in and out very quickly there. And I think it's a tall order for a young man like him. I think Johnny Kenny's injured. You know, I believe that he's unavailable just now. He might have been a shout. Um, and then maybe Owen Moffat to a far lesser extent. Has Ange really got no choice but Jack Amakis or do you see other options for him? I, th- well, I think it's, um, you know, Yeti's obviously not back either. Um, so I think you're you're looking at either Jack Amakis or Abada. And I just don't think he would play a bad up front. I just think what you'd be doing to, to Yakimakis is, you know, confidence if, if you took him out the firing line for such a big game and effectively played a winger up front. I, I think Ange really likes Gigi and I think he'll he'll look to give him the opportunity. So I, I don't even feel like it's as much as you as much as you've asked me that question, I don't think it's much of a debate. Yeah. Um, I, I think that Yakimakis will start the game. I'm pretty confident about that. Right hand side I actually think it will be a badder. Um, rather than Forrest I think Abad actually did play at Tyne Castle I think first game of the season yeah, scored a goal if you remember oh, yeah, well, a, a, a Bobby goal. Madden says no so um, he, he does know the environment he's, he's going into it wasn't a full house that time but he'll, he'll still know what he's going into um, so I think you know Jota on the left Abad on the right and, and Gigi up front I'm, yeah. I'm, I think that's what we'll see now would that be what you think Angel do or what you would like him to do do you prefer Abad to Forrest at this moment in time uh, in general I prefer Forrest I'm a big James Forrest fan and I've been quite critical of Leal Abad it's kind of the not the done thing to be critical of Abad because he's only 20 years old and he's had all these you know goal contributions mm-hmm. but I think you know between the period of probably about you know October until the St Johnson game basically I thought he was really poor constantly yeah. really poor looked short of confidence, didn't offer as much at all, apart from the occasional goal out of nowhere. But I think the two games he's come back, he's been excellent in both games and I think he's in a real good place and, you know, match fit as well. And I think that's why I'd put him in. His stats are excellent, Paddy, and, you know, Hamish has got a, you know, a fair point there. It's interesting, you know, his his goal on Saturday, it's a brilliant finish, mm-hmm. but it actually comes from a bit of a mistake by him in the first place. He tries to play a 1-2, it ends up rebounding off the Alloa defender. So you've got the break of the ball there. But his finish can't be in question. But, you know, it's kind of, it almost sums a bad up in a microcosm yeah. there. You know, he's, he's made a mistake, but he gets goals out of nothing. And you can't deny with those stats. Is it something like 18 or 19 goal contributions since coming in? 10 yeah. and 9, I think, yeah. yeah. 10 goals, 9 assists as a 20-year-old kid. So he's doing something, right? Absolutely. And I agree with what you're saying, that he kind of tailed off a bit um, around about the October period um, onwards. I think, again, that's someone that's maybe just been getting caught up with the occasion uh, of... You know, coming to that club, effectively hitting the ground running and and having in such a very good positive start, it's then taking the toll on the amount of games that the, the, uh, he he'd been playing um, as well, and probably just try to get used to everything that he's not, he's not done in his career so far. Mm. And I think possibly, obviously, the winter break is is definitely helped him. Um, I kind of looked at some of the games he played around about November, December and taking a player on, trying to knock the ball past, he just didn't want to do it. So the mistake came from him trying to do that and mm-hmm. that's a sign of where he is just now. And I can see actually, yeah, it, make, it makes a good shout that he definitely takes a claim for starting. Um, I would be I, I would be interested to see if, um, you know, if he does start 
on Wednesday, then does he maybe get like the hour and they bring on Forrest then yeah. or something, just depending on obviously how the game goes. But I wouldn't be surprised if Forrest gets the nod as well, just because of the, the games coming up. And then you're maybe looking at how, obviously we've got the United and uh, Saturday coming up and then we've got the, the game on um, the second. Who who does he want to keep fresh for that? Who does he want to keep, like, or who does he want to start for that as well? So He might, he might be thinking ahead. Quick one though, who starts for you, Abad or Forrest? Um, my heart would love James Forrest. Uh, I, I kind of, I, I think he's basically our best winger on the right, personally. I think he should start. Um, would I be surprised if a bad started? No. no. He's also carrying that knock. Obviously, he didn't finish the 90 minutes against Alo Abada, so mm -hmm. there's maybe a hangover from that. I also feel just as, as a more general point that I think Ange has had to use him and had to line him far more than he maybe wanted yeah. to. He's brought in, a, at the time, a 19-year-old winger, you know, from Israel and new to the country and everything that comes with that. I think if he had the depth of squad that he ultimately wants... He'd have dropped him in and out at different times, but he's played a lot of football. And I think it's little wonder that, you know, he started here and it's then been a bit of a, a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Here, for those who are watching on YouTube, audio <laughs> only, can't help you guys. But it's been a bit of a roller coaster for Abada. And I think it's just natural that, that he'll come and go. Um, on Thursday of last week, Celtic confirmed the signing of full time catwalk model and part time footballer Matt O'Reilly from MK Dons for a fee believed to be somewhere in the region of 1.5 million. The 21 year old looks like a serious talent, and previous coaches rave about him. But Hamish, is he ready to start against Hearts at Tyne Castle? I think if you looked at a new signing and, and you looked at kind of what they would need to be able to make a quick introduction and a quick impact at Celtic, he would have a lot of it. He's he's got a decent physique, you know. He's I think he's quite tall. Is he six six one, two? Six two, a wee bit shorter than me, but still a decent height. Um, <laughs> good with his feet as well. Good good strength. I think he's got a good engine, kind of box to box type player as well. And I think you know it's maybe a, a, a kind of simplistic comment to make, but. The fact he's played in, you know, England, you know, he's, it's not going to be that much of an adjustment. It's not as if, you know, we're signing a player from Japan and, and chucking him right into it. So, and the point you made earlier, Paddy, the fact that he's he's going to go in and he's almost not going to know where he is until it hits him. Mm -hmm. and, and the match is going to start and then you just hope his footballing ability, yeah. you know, shows through at that stage. I, I, you Sometimes you just get a feeling and I've got just a feeling that tomorrow night he's the kind of player who could have a really, really strong debut. Yeah. Paddy, he's also got these really piercing eyes. They're going to help him, aren't they? Uh, uh, they'll be too busy looking at him to try and defend against him. You know, it's going to be one of the games. Yeah. No, I think um, someone that's kind of brought himself back uh, from being, you know, let go from Fulham, um, his determination speaks volumes. Um, but I ain't saying he, he's, he's captained MK Dons this season. I believe so, yeah. I mean that's that's huge for someone still at the age of twenty one. Um, Their fans love him, like they absolutely love him. Yeah, yeah, I've seen I've seen a few. Yeah, basically we've got a player here, and albeit yeah, it's League One, um, but you know the standard isn't hugely different from what we're, we're up against week in week out. Um, Hearts is obviously I have to say that they've had a great season um, so far. I think it's going to be a difficult game. They'll crowd us in that area, but yeah. Go for it, let's see what you can do. Yeah, I mean, just to stay on O'Reilly for a second, so the you'd mentioned Paddy, his, his club initially was full of making through the ranks there. I think he knows uh, Paddy Roberts. I think mm -hmm. he was the year below him at school and there's a bit of different chat around that. He's very highly thought of from all his previous coaches and as you say, Hamish, by the fans. And the line is that he took a gamble on himself career-wise. So Fulham offered him a deal, but he didn't want to languish in the reserves and, you know, bit of game time here and there. So he took the chance to go down a level to MK Dons, prove himself there. And he's done that, you know, I think he signed for the, them in January 21. So just, you know, a year or so ago. And he's really became a, a firm favourite. And the good thing is as well, the MK Dons fans seem to be really keen for it to go well. They're, they're wishing them all the best. They see this as a real stepping stone from, and like a lot of players, you know, just to accept where we are in the rankings just now, if he comes and sets the heather alight here, we might get him for a few seasons. Maybe Hatati's in that bracket, so not to put a dampener on anything, but hopefully these guys come, really show what they're worth. He's 21 years of age. Mm -hmm. He could get some really good years off him, and then he moves on. I mean, have you, you guys, did you cover it? Did you get someone on to speak about him? Yeah, we did. It, it was interesting as well that there's so much kind of stuff you can read about um, Matt O'Reilly, and, and, you know, you're right that he took that big gamble leaving Fulham. He could have stayed at Fulham. Apparently was quite highly rated there by Scott Parker. Probably would have got his opportunity by now and been on probably, well, certainly a, a much better wage than he would have at, at MK Dons. But he, he took that gamble. And to add something into it, he did that 
you know, when the pandemic was just beginning, it was around that time, which just adds even more, you know, risk into a situation, mm -hmm. you know, going back to, what was it, March 2020, when nobody knew it was happening. He was, I think, training in local parks. He went yep. about five or six, seven months without having a club. Eventually trained with, with MK Dons under Russell Martin, who who he was impressed, or he impressed Russell Martin, got a contract and, and kind of hasn't looked back from there. And we know, you know, how, how much emphasis Ange places onto new signings kind of mentality and how they come across as people as well as footballers. When you actually hear Ange talking about a new signing, he rarely actually speaks about their footballing ability. It's more about what they bring to the dressing room. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Matt O'Reilly, he, he strikes me and he, he strikes a lot of people as quite a driven guy. Um, he's been described as being really humble as well, mm -hmm. really motivated. And he just ticks all those boxes for, for what Ange needs. And again, you compare it to the kind of players we were signing 18 months ago, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's night and day. Yeah, I think he could be a really exciting signing, Paddy. I think so. And just going back to what you were kind of saying, that like Ange is talking about these players and what, what he feels about them mm -hmm. personally almost. Um mm -hmm. There's something huge for me about the amount of players that have signed for us this season that have all came back and said, well, when I had a chat with a gaffer, or I had yeah. a chat with a manager, that's huge. Yeah. You know, I think that's, there's something, you know, it, it needs to work both ways. Um, we obviously seen with the the Riley deal um, that that wasn't going to be the case. And, we're, well, well we're, we're sorted ourselves out here very quick. We were told there was going to be no more signings. And then all of a sudden, bang, 48, 48 hours later, we've signed Matt O'Reilly. And yeah, I, I, I think that a lot of players want to come and play for Ange, as well as Celtic. And it kind of reminds me of the, the Neil days in the sense that uh, there was a lot of players that played for Martin O'Neill, not for Celtic as much. They played for Martin O'Neill and then understood what this club was all about when they got yeah. here. And I kind of hope that the players that have came here, they've came for Ange, but we'll totally understand what we're all about as well. I think that's a great point, Paddy, because I think guys like Martin O'Neill and like Ange, they've got an aura, they've got a presence and these figures, you know, who are, you know, Ange always talks about the custodians or the current custodians of the club. They're the gateway for some of these players because, you listen, there's no doubt Matt O'Reilly knows all about Celtic, you know, just, you know, being a guy who's grown up in the UK playing football, but Ange has reached out, given him the personal touch and sold him the vision and he's, he's had offers. I think West Brom tried to hijack the offer and potentially more money but he's seen what Ange is looking to do at this club and he's got on board. And, you know, that's really exciting to be able to attract that kind of young talent. So hopefully he gets a start against Hearts. I think that could be a, you know, a real baptism of fire, but no time like the present to, to show what he can do. So I think there's a, a pretty fair chance he might start alongside Hattati in that more advanced number 10 type role. Just on that, so to bring it back to the Hearts game, do you think, we spoke about it again last night, Hamish, but do you think, I'll put it to you, Paddy, that Ange might consider a double pivot at the back, so two deeper line midfielders with one guy in the point, whether that's Hattati with maybe, I don't know, a Beaton and a McCarthy or a Gucci sitting deeper. Or, as Hamish pointed out last night, he didn't change it in the Bay Arena. Why would he change it for Tynecastle? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, who are we up against in their mid? Is it Halliday? I don't know. Show some respect. Well, is it? <laughs> get the the Aussie Come boy, uh, Cammy Devlin. Yeah, um, yeah. I think the the guy Beningami may be back. He's a really good player. Yeah, he's he's actually might be back. A but decent I think, season for them. Yeah, um, and obviously, open goals finest Andy Halliday as well. Come on. <laughs> he's no changing it I don't think he is no, isn't he? I've no. just got to ask these questions Same as they're on the agenda So you know you want, how it goes do, do you want a more long worded answer? No it's fine <laughs> We'll just skip past it um, So just speaking of Hearts Barry You rightfully mentioned though They've had a, a really decent season so far uh, Hearts at Tyne Castle It's up there with One of the toughest fixtures in the calendar We know we've all, already lost there In the opening game Way back on Saturday 31st of July we had our injury, injury worries then, we've got our injury worries now, but Hamish, do you think we're better equipped to deal with them at this moment in time, even despite what's going on? 100%, because you go back to the, the team we had back then, and uh, I think that was Kyogo's debut, wasn't it, off mm -hmm. the bench, and Starfelt's debut, and he looked quite uncertain that night. Um, Ralston certainly wasn't the player he is now. Um, it was, I don't even want to think who was in the midfield at that point. You're dismissing Ralston's glory goal that day. Yeah, that well, that was brilliant. the making of him. Do you that know? Was it. Um, but <laughs> yeah, no, but we're definitely in a, in a much better place. Um, it's just a shame what you were saying earlier, Paddy. The, the fact that fans want to see our our full strength team, and we want to see you know Christopher Julian back. We want to see a fully fit James Forrest. Can, you know who's going to win that battle with Forrest and Abada? Who's going to be our striker if you know 
Yakimakis starts banging them in. If Maida's playing well, is it going to be Maida or Jota off, off the left? There, there's so many questions, but we're just not getting that at the moment because there's just so many injuries. Um, and, and obviously tomorrow we're, we're going to see that. It's not going to be a full-strength Celtic team yeah. um, because we're missing so many players. But I still think we've got more than enough there in the team that starts to, to go to Tynecastle and, and win. I think it's going to be really tough, but we've got enough there. So this brings me back to my quadruple. Uh, quadri- <laughs> my ca- ca- quadri- can't even see it. I know, can't even see it. It brings me back to the claim that we're going to win all four. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we look at these players coming back and, you know, if the squad's firing all cylinders, everyone's getting game time. Who's to say? We can't. You never know. I mean, so, I mean... To stay with this particular game, it will definitely be a tough test. Uh, Hearts have won six out of their last eight. They're in very good form. The only two defeats are by ourselves and Rangers. They're the, the only blips in recent times. They're very comfortably in third position. They're eight points ahead of Motherwell in fourth. Here's a question. Uh, John Souter's been making the headlines because of his pre-contract agreement. Will he be looking to endear himself to his future employers by putting a marker down, leaving one on someday? I'd be surprised if he started. You think so? Mm-hmm. Apparently, he's, today apparently he's, he's going. Eh? He's in the mix. He's in the mix. Yeah. Did he start at the weekend? No. No. He, he had a, an injury. An injury. Mm. Apparently, eh? says uh, Robbie. It's at Tynecastle. They gave him dogs abuse. The fans the other week. I would be surprised mm. if he's he's maybe in the, the match day squad, but I would be surprised. The bottom line is, I think he's a decent player. You know, there's obviously concerns over his injury woes, but he's a decent footballer, and I think they're a better side with him. Mm-hmm. I think it's more of a challenge. I think him and Jack Amakis might be quite an intriguing contest. A couple of physical guys, but. Just very naturally, there's two things going on for John Souter. One, he's persona non grata right now with the Hearts fans, but I think he'll want to try and prove a point that he's still committed to the, the cause, at least until the end of the season. And very naturally, coming up against Celtic, big rivals to his new employer, yeah. he'll be looking to do something, won't he? I think so, yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. As you say, he was getting dogs abuse at, at, whenever they played, was it last, last midweek? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. will that continue? I think it probably plays into our hands if it does. It'd I be so. it'd be great to go up against a team who's in a bit of disarray with the support, you know, having a go at one of their own players. I'm more than happy for for that to be the case. Um, I just I think Hearts are a, a pretty good side. I think there's an argument they're they're one of the best sides we've seen in Scotland in a few years. They've got, you know, players all, all around the pitch. There's not really a, a weak point in that team. Um, I think Halkett's a really good centre back. Mm-hmm. They've obviously got a goalkeeper who we know ourselves has his moments, but in general is a good goalkeeper and always seems to have a good game against us. I think Liam Boyce is is a good striker by, by Scottish good. Premiership level. Yeah. And then on the wings, you know, I don't know if GMS is going to be fit, but certainly Barry Mackay uh, c- can cause any team, you know, hassle in, in Scotland. So they've got players, you know, all around the pitch that I'd be kind of worried about. Um, the, the positive for us is that basically all of our injuries are attacking injuries. So there should be no real, you know, reason for the defence not to be right on top of their games you know it should be Joe Hart Juranovic CCV Starfelt and Greg Taylor which is probably our, our first choice defence so if we keep a clean sheet a back is to, to have enough quality even missing those players in an attacking sense to get a goal or two Yeah another factor that will play into it is the fact Paddy that I think there's only a thousand tickets for Celtic fans at the game so that, that can make an impact because it is a hostile place to mm-hmm. go the home fans will be Baying for blood and all that stuff. Are you heading along, Paddy? Are you going? Uh, not making it, no. Not making it this no. time. Do you think that'll have an impact on the game? Um, this has happened a few times at Ten Castle lately. Um, I think they eventually started to give us a bit more more seats back um, in the last couple of seasons. But this this has happened before. I, I don't think it's really phased us, to be honest. Um, again, I go back to like a lot of these players, this is all new to them. Um and obviously, yeah, a few of them have had their first experience at the beginning of the season. I, no, I don't see it phasing them. Um, it, the Hearts fans will be there to make noise, but if if uh, Suter does play, then yeah, that, that goes in our favour. I agree with you there. Um, no, I don't think it really matters for us tomorrow night. Yeah, yeah tomorrow night. Either way, it's an intriguing one and hopefully we come back with all three points from that one. Before we continue with the next section of the show, many of you will know that we ran a competition on our YouTube channel last week, giving one lucky viewer the chance to win this season's home shirt with their choice of name and number on the back. 
I'm pleased to announce that the lucky winner in question this week is Chris Higgins. And Chris, we'll get that sorted out for you over the next couple of days. Just drop us a short email at the Celtic Exchange at gmail.com and we can make those arrangements with you. Thanks to everyone who entered the competition and please continue to support us on YouTube by subscribing to the Celtic Exchange channel, liking this episode and joining the debate by leaving a comment in the comment section. It makes a huge difference to what we do and it's really appreciated by all of us here at the Celtic Exchange. Okay, and let's get back to the show. After time, Castle Paddy, we're back at Celtic Park for the visit of Dundee United and whilst they've had a decent season overall, they're actually in a very poor run of form so they're sitting just outside the top six just now and they've lost their last six league games on the bounce. What kind of challenge do you think that'll be? Again, it's just basically we're at home, bigger park. We were, we were quite stuffy against them um, when we played round about the end of, was it the end of September we played them at Celtic Park and we drew with them. But we opened them up a bit at Tanadice. Um, I think, again, it's just been a bit quicker than them. Technically, I think we're better than them. I don't see them being much of a threat. But again, a lot of teams like to come to Celtic Park and sit in. So we just need to be better on the day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I'm not too worried about that one. As long as we keep some players fit and you know, we've got a fresh enough team, I think we should be okay. Yeah. Hey, Mish, on paper, this one should be far more straightforward than Tynecastle. But will it be? Well, these are the kind of games we've actually maybe struggled in more this season, certainly in recent months. Um, Livingston at home, St Mirren away were, were games that I think in a, a tough run of fixtures, games that we kind of written off as, as simple victories and they were the ones that actually tripped us up. So I think we have to be very careful. Um, well, we don't, but, you know, the team do uh, on Saturday. And if they, they win at, at Tynecastle on Wednesday, then just keep going because it's it's no good winning on Wednesday if we can't back it up on, on Saturday. And likewise, you know, the following Wednesday against Rangers, that's just where we're at at the moment. Every game is just a must win. Yeah. Our form's been brilliant, you know, over the last, probably since, you know, that Dundee United game mm-hmm. at Celtic Park. I think we've only dropped maybe four points, but it's that start to the season that's given us no or very little margin for error. Um, so we just need to keep winning. But I think, you know, in general, Saturday should be all right. Um, I'd like to see us blowing a team away. At Celtic Park, uh, I can't remember the last time we did that. I think it's all been, you know, one goal, two goal victories. And that was fine, you know, during the months of November and, and December. But I'd like to think, you know, with some players back, yes, we'll still be missing players. But I'd like to to see us maybe win, you know, three, maybe even four nil against a, a struggling team. Yeah, it would definitely give us a boost. Paddy, signing wise, Tony, what's been the, the big headline for Dundee United during January? He'll always look to prove a point at Celtic Park, given his history with the club. Uh, they got that one each draw you mentioned last time. I think it was 26th of September, so a fair while ago now. A bad, I get the goal on the day, but we conceded right after. I think it was, is it John Harks, the Ian. American? I, I was in the toilet for that. Um, uh, a bad had just scored, so I thought it'd be a, a perfectly safe time to <laughs> nip away. And I was actually, without getting too graphic here, I was... I was ah, do- keep, keep, keep a sweet and short. Do, doing my business while standing up next to another guy when we got the announcement of the Dundee United equaliser, me and the guy had a kind of weird moment where we, we locked eyes and just went, oh no. <laughs> what you do in your own free time, Hamish, is entirely up to yourself. Um, but yeah, they got that draw and that will give them confidence, albeit they're on a very poor run, six defeats on the bounce. Do you think they'll believe in themselves to do so again, Paddy? Um, again, it just, it's up to them to, to come up against us and try and get the result. They will set themselves out like most of the lower half of the, the table have and sit in against us. I don't see them trying to play football the way they kind of did the last time. Yeah, they yeah. actually did come out against us a few times and, and done well. They had a couple of good chances, I remember, in the first half. A um, couple of um, great crosses across the face of our goal and it was just des- like desperate to be tapped in. But... Mm-hmm. Um, because of their form, I think that they might just sit in and just try and soak it up and see how they get. If they can get to half time, I, I think they'll be aiming for a draw on Saturday. I don't see them trying to do anything spectacular. You might well be right. They, they did have that decent spell of form at the start of the season mm-hmm. and they were in the midst of that when they came up against us. Now, when you're six defeats in the bounce, your headspace is very different and any sort of drop Celtic Park would be deemed a result. I mean, injuries pending, you know, touch wood, we don't pick up anything else at Tynecastle, but I'd expect it'll be very similar lineups for Hearts and for Dundee United. But do you think Ange might try and freshen up in places? We've obviously got the Forest and Abada debate. Do you think Julian might come into the mix? Potentially. Um, Ralston's the obvious one, I think, would, would come in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I could see as I don't know what you, you think about this long term, but I could see as almost going game to game between those two, Ralston and Juranovic, because they're, they're both playing so well. 
Um, Julian, possibly. James Forrest, possibly. Um, yeah, other than that, we midfield, we certainly don't have the, the wriggle room. Maybe, you know, Gucci, if he's back at that stage, could come back in. But it, the players are able to, to, to play these matches. They've been doing it all season anyway, so I've not got any real concerns. Yeah. One thing I would say, and I agree with you there, is that... As a fan, when players haven't been playing that that much, you do feel as if it is a huge risk bringing them back in when every game does seem like a bit of a cup final. Mm -hmm. But the the levels that um, Postacoglu wants them at, the, the level of fitness that he wants them at, the, the amount of times this season he's come back and said, you know, that they're, they're, they're back training, they're fit, but they're not ready. Yeah. And... I think every player that has come in into that starting eleven is ready to play football, is ready to give the 90 minutes. Um, so I'd be confident with any of those kind of changes, definitely. Yeah, it could be really interesting because a lot of them will feel refreshed from having had their kind of mini break there, the winter break. But the fixture list is relentless. And it'd be interesting to see how Ange plays that. I think we know he's generally, he plays his strongest. He mm. doesn't really like to rest, guys. I think he's quoted as saying that. I don't rest players. You know, you play if you're fit and available. So it'd be very interesting to see, you know, what he does in these next two games. But if you're going for the quadruple, then... <laughs> that's easy for you to say. That's easy for me to say. <laughs> you need to rotate your team. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's, it's a lot of football. Tell me this, lads. Would you accept a draw against Hearts and a win against Dundee United on Saturday before we head into that Glasgow derby next week? Or do we need a maximum of six out of six? I can see you're shaking heads already. <laughs> Tell me six no, as I say, six. we've just not got that 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 wiggle room, and I, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even accept six and then a point in the derby. I think we, I just think we, we we don't need to win all three because if we don't win all three, we're not giving up in the title. I always think when folks say you have you you need to win, it's a bit you know too much. But we could really do with winning all three games because I think we have to send out a message to them across the city where as much as they're winning not everything's going right for them yeah. we mm -hmm. need to just keep the pressure on and it's three huge games and, and as I said earlier I hope the middle one Dundee United doesn't go under the radar because we have to treat that with the exact same whatever as the other two you yeah. get the same three points regardless yeah, if you exactly. beat Dundee United or Ross County I mean Paddy you sound like you're wanting nine points out of the next two games uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> if it was possible then take it yeah. you know no it, Listen, it's two home games for us in this next three. Um, we we should be looking for maximum points, in my opinion. I know how difficult Tynecastle is for us to go to, but you know, it's this is it's not make or break. I totally agree. It's not. It's a little early, isn't it? It is, but it's it's laying down a huge marker yeah. if we go and take all three all three games. Definitely, I, I think just it's a real crucial period. Hamish, we've touched on it. The next five league games it's, they're so so important and they could have a huge bearing on where we land what we'll do we've obviously spent a fair bit of time there covering Hearts and Dundee United so I'm going to put you lads in the spot and ask for your predictions for those two games Hamish I'll come to you first uh, a dramatic win over Hearts 2-1 and Scott think, Sinclair still yeah last, I'm expecting a one. Scott Sinclair winner or off the bench that's what I'm predicting on Wednesday um, and then Saturday 3-0 uh, I think we'll score a few okay yourself Paddy I'm thinking that we'll do that surprising thing where we think it's going to be a tight game and it'll end up 2-0 quite comfortable against Hearts. I'm hoping. But then it'll be stuffy on Saturday and it'll be 1-0. Yeah. So I'm going against a, you. There, a late Hames. goal or an early goal? Nah, early goal, but we'll just be like... Motherwell style. Yeah, I get this over the line. If the crowd will get frustrated, all of that number, you know, just... Do you know what? <laughs> I'm a bit along those lines, Paddy. I think... You know, we've obviously talked up Hearts and, and the challenge that we'll face there. I think we might find it a bit comfier than Hearts than we do against United. Mm. The, the reason for my thinking there is that Hearts at home, boy at home crowd, third on the table, they'll feel that they they should and, and will come out at some point and, and try and play a bit of football. That plays right into our hands. Absolutely. More so when we've got Kyogo and, and Maeda to call upon with their pace getting in behind. But I think as a club in the way Ange sets up his teams, that might really suit us and, you know, really be in our favour. United at home, I think they'll shut up shop, park the bus, low block, whatever term you want to use. And it could be another stuffy one. Maybe a late Jack and Marcus Pentley could uh, <laughs> clinch all three points, but we'll need to see. I'm going to go for 3-1 against Hearts uh, during the week and 2-0 against Dundee United. So we'll see how that plays out. At time of recording, guys, there's just one week left of the transfer window. It closes at 11 o'clock next Monday, 31st of July. Paddy, I'll be well in my bed by that point, but do you still think we need to carry out any more business between now and then? He said no before Matt O'Reilly, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ange likes to play the games, doesn't like he? It. He mentioned, we're not speaking to anyone, no one's on our radar. Five days later, we get O'Reilly. What do you think, Hamish? Is there work to be done? Well, to, to take Ange at, at face value, I, I, I don't think he'll sign anyone unless it, it's 
impossible not to unless someone too good to Something turn down. special. Yeah. Um and yeah, I I don't really think so to be honest. Um I'm I'm really pleased with the work we've done. I'm I'm looking across the squad and left back's maybe the only place I would look to bring someone in, but I think he quite likes Greg Taylor and Liam Scales. Mm-hmm. Um I think the goalkeeper kinda of issue with regards to a backup's been spoken about a bit. Obviously Scott Bain recently signed his his new contract and I think the club are, are gearing all the way Amy up as as yeah. the kind of next uh, successor to Joe Hart. So mm-hmm. I think we're fine in that area as well. Um up top, you know, playing one striker, we've we've probably got options there when Kyogo, Maida and even a Yeti to an extent come back. Um maybe yeah, if, if Johnson or someone like that goes out, possibly. Um, but I, I think we're quite well set at the moment. It just doesn't seem like it right now because we've got so many players missing. But when you actually look at everyone that we've got in our books, it's a very good squad we've mm-hmm. got. Yeah, and on that note, Paddy, do you think that to an extent exits must be part of the priority for Ange because we've spoken in recent weeks on the show about you know a, a, a challenge for him is to you know to keep the harmony up at Lennox Town and make sure you don't have too much guys who are on the wings, are, are waiting in the wings who are never going to feature. So the obvious ones are, you know, guys like Barkas, Bolingoli, Ayeti, maybe Sorrow, maybe Loans for the likes of Montgomery and, and Uruguiri. Mm-hmm. I clocked a, a cryptic post by Barkas just this afternoon. Mm-hmm. Did you see it? He was away somewhere. He put an Instagram post up with the, the tagline, on the road, although it looks like he's actually on a train. So <laughs> not, not quite on the road Kenny, as much Kenny as sums him up, doesn't he's it? on the track. <laughs> I, not, not like Barkas to get it wrong, so maybe on the tracks, but... It might be the case that he's moving out elsewhere. And I think, listen, I put him, Bollingoli and Ayeti in the exact same bracket for their own sakes, for their own careers, as much as for whatever Celtic's doing. These guys need to move on, don't they? I I definitely agree. I think now, um, you know, the players were brought in. It's it's signalled that there isn't much, well, there's no chance for them really getting back into their squads um, at all. Um, yeah, um, do they go this window? I don't know. Is, are, are teams interested? I'd say maybe for Barkas back home in Greece, possibly. Um, there's been chat about uh, Bolingoli, a few teams interested as well. I've not heard much on a Yeti. Um, and I think a Yeti's contract maybe stops that from happening just now. Yeah. Maybe in the summer. Yeah, the suggestion is he's on 18 grand a week. Yeah. So it depends what kind of personality he is, but he might be quite happy to sit tight. And the fact that these guys aren't and haven't played a lot of football, it's a gamble for whoever signs them. Yeah, and, and yet he's obviously injured as well at the moment. So you, you wonder if he'd be able to go anywhere. Sorrow is another one I'd add to that list. I, I yeah. just don't see, you know, a future for him. And I don't think Ange does either. Was there chat about, um, was it New York Red Bulls yeah. were looking at him? It went quite quiet on that. They were wanting to add a, another ex-Celtic player. They've not, they've not got enough. They've just signed, I think, Lewis Morgan. They've got Cl- right. Clamalla. They've got Cameron Harper. Cameron they had Gut- Gutman last season. Yeah. So they're, they're obviously building something yeah. there. If they could take Barkas and I get it, doing is a real solid. <laughs> yeah, so. feed, feeder club, New York, or Red Bull Celtic yeah. or something yeah. like that. <laughs> I, I think we will see quite a lot of activity uh, exiting uh, Celtic Park towards the end of the window. And I think I mentioned last week, that I think that's a time where agents and players hold the cards you know the closer to the to the end of the window it gets people get a wee bit desperate and I think we might be able to offload some of that talent then and I think that'll just be you know a refreshing thing to do and, and obviously incomings have been the priority for Ange but I think it's important as well that he just keeps the balance and, and keeps things ticking over there of course I think um, I think he has done well this market it's not very often we act so quickly in a January um, and get the job done straight away but Again, possible signings for us that before the end of this window can be based on these next two games. We hope we come through them unscathed, no more injuries and no more having to just kind of back the team up. Um, but one thing I would love, and I hope you're listening, Celtic FC, is... Uh, they, they never miss an episode. They probably. never miss an episode. Uh, before this game next week, it would be lovely if we announced two signings and uh, that would be... Carter Vickers and Jota that would be lovely it's interesting when, you, when you're saying you know how important it was that we did the business early mm-hmm. can you imagine we were going into these games without having signed O'Reilly Hatate I know Ediguchi you, you would literally in, in my day you'd literally be looking at a midfield at, at Tynecastle of like Beaton McCarthy and 
Barkas. Barkas, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. You would have been pulling a couple of kids for the, the uh, B team yeah. to fill up your bench as well. So it's that, right. that's how important it was that we did it. Good. Yeah, never quite considered that, but it's, it's horrific if you consider the guys that we might have been without. So, so. Sorrow. Sorrow would probably have been in, wouldn't he? Yeah. yeah. And that's not a great position to be in. Amish, what we'll do is we start to wrap things up for today. First of all, just want to thank you for joining us here on the show. It's been great to have you on. Uh, do you want to let uh, everyone know where they can see a bit more about yourself? And following that, give us your final thoughts for this episode. Yeah, um, so I'm from 67 Hail Hail. You've, you've probably heard of the website, maybe more so than the, the YouTube channel. It's 67hailhail.com. Uh, we're also obviously on YouTube. If you just search for 67 Hail Hail, we post daily videos um, with the likes of Scott McDonald, Jackie McNamara, me, slightly less star studded, but, but still <laughs> the, an important member of the team, um, numerous other guys as well. We do live reactions to, to pretty much every game um, and, and more stuff like this as well. So I think if you're a, a fan of this wonderful podcast, then you'll, you'll probably enjoy our stuff as well. And yeah, just looking forward to it. Um, nervous about Wednesday, but you know, this is this is what you want as a, a football fan. I think you love sport when it matters and it didn't matter last season. It just didn't matter at all because there was no fans in the stadium. We were awful and, and this year everything seems to matter. You can really feel the, the nervousness in every single Celtic game mm-hmm. and, you know, conversely, if it goes well, um, we'll, we'll get some joy out of it. So hopefully that's the way it goes. Yeah, I think it really does matter and I think as fans, you know, we can speak you know for a wider audience who are just really relishing each and every Celtic game just now and it's all there to be enjoyed and that just comes with being successful and being competitive and Ange has played such an important part of that so you're absolutely right you know exciting games tough games but really ones to look forward to Paddy I mentioned at the top of the show listeners have been crying out for your return it's good to have you back what's your final comments for the week uh, it's been lovely to be back um Thank you for coming on as well man um keep doing what you're doing it's brilliant and no uh, honestly um Big fan of the Hail Hail guys, so keep keep up with it. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. No worries, that. no problem. Um, Tino, good seeing you again as well. It's been great to be back on, and I'm just more refreshed than our players for the second half of the season. <laughs> You've had an extended winter break yourself, Paddy, so you'll be geared up for the next few weeks. Eh? Absolutely, absolutely. Perfect. So we now enter a crucial few weeks of the season and we'll have a far clearer idea of the destination of the league title by the time we come out the other side. If we are to do it, then we'll have to do it the hard way without several of our key players. But then, when have Celtic ever made things easy? Thanks to Paddy and Hamish for joining me on today's show and of course our thanks to you for continuing to follow and support the Celtic Exchange. Please continue to do so by liking, subscribing and sharing this episode far and wide with your Celtic network. It really makes a big difference to what we do. But in the meantime, and as always, thanks for tuning in.